Unbeknownst to Christina Crosby, here to my right, I have been stalking her for a very long time. I first encountered Crosby while, re she doesn't know any of this, I first encountered Crosby while reading the now canonical 1992 anthology, Feminist Theorized the Political, edited by Judith Butler and Joan Scott, where Crosby's essay, Dealing with Differences, offers observations that spoke to me then and still resonate now, today, in this room and at this workshop. Wrestling with the thorny problem of differences and diversity in universities, Crosby presciently argues, quote, these questions are especially pressing given the widespread attention now accorded to diversity and the fractious debates over the politicizing of the university. To approach these questions, this is still Crosby, I will return to women's studies, taking this field not as marginal to the academy as a whole, but rather as an exemplary discourse in which difference and differences have had a long career and in which theory has always been articulated with politics. So I read this essay in my first year of graduate school as I had barely embarked on a PhD in history. No sooner had I begun to study something that I thought I understood, women's history, then Christina Crosby came around to tell me that I needed to criti criti critically reconsider both women and history. <laughs> Quote, to specify is not necessarily to historicize, Crosby cautioned. Sorry. <laughs> Effective history, which is to say knowledge which is not a reflection of the already known, the taken for granted, the obviously true, introduces discontinuity into knowledge, not only being. That is, knowledge, if it is to avoid the circularity of ideology, must read the processes of differentiation, not look for differences. So I was already in trouble before I, she got me in trouble before I even started my PhD, really. Crosby's first book, The Ends of History, or situation here. Uh, the Ends of History, Victorians and the Woman Question, published by Rutledge in 1990, deftly puts literary studies in conversation with philosophy and history, and taking up the challenge of interdisciplinarity, guides her readers to a more critical perspective on all of these disciplines. As one reviewer notes, The Ends of History, quote, offers fresh and courageous thought as obvious as is obvious on every other page. In the spring of 2004, this is where we get into serious stalking. In the spring of 2004, as I was preparing to embark on a summer of dedicated to revising my first book, I received an email from our colleague Robin Wigman. Attuned to my desire for a change of scene, Robin told me that a friend of hers had a nice apartment in New York City that I could sublet. The owner's partner, Robin explained, was a professor at Wesleyan and had been in a terrible cycling accident. So not only have I been stalking Christina Crosby for a quarter century, I spent the better part of a summer sleeping in her partner's bed. <laughs> Some people will stop at nothing. <laughs> By the time I encountered Crosby's stunning memoir, A Body Undone, Living On After Great Pain, I myself had been through two major cycling accidents, both resulting in serious concussions, broken vertebrae, and technicolor contusions. At first, when I read this book, I could barely see past the unsettling account of such a freak accident, an experienced and highly skilled cyclist getting a branch caught in her spokes as she ascended a hill. This was no rookie careening wildly on a descent, and the enemy was a branch, a tree branch, rather than a careless driver or a cell phone fixated pedestrian. As Crosby's many admiring reviewers have noted, what follows is not some treacly account of triumph over adversity. It is the work of an immensely gifted reader and writer considering the text of her own body, immobilized and yet still in constant pain. Unable, as she notes, even to fart, <laughs> but remembering the physical pleasures of sex with her partner Janet, of dressing up in a silk shirt and leather pants for a night on the town in New York City, of expertly shifting through gears to maintain her cadence as she conquered a hill on her bicycle. I've now read this, sorry, I'm gonna get choked up here. <laughs> I've now read this book several times. I've listened to Crosby read it. I've assigned it to students and gifted it to family and friends. I am mesmerized by this personal exploration of the questions that have absorbed feminist scholars for decades of sexuality and embodiment, of family formations and psychoanalysis, of affect and the pleasures of intellect. I can think of no book that better conveys to academics and non-academics alike, why feminist theory matters even 
or perhaps especially in moments of crisis. When I learned that Christina Crosby would be offering a keynote address to this year's Feminist Theory Workshop, I cleared my calendar and jumped at the opportunity to introduce her. So it is an immense honor to welcome to Duke a scholar whose thinking and writing so forcefully demonstrates the power of feminist theories. Please join me in welcoming Christina Crosby. Thank you for that uh, affectively rich and remarkable introduction. Um, and thank you to everybody who uh, has worked to get me here, all the staff who have worked, and for the initial invitation to come and participate in this event. I'm very pleased to be here. Loss is inseparable from what remains. I grew up in central Pennsylvania, where in the 1950s, coal-fired furnaces heated most homes. Now and then, my father would shrug on the coveralls that hung on a hook at the top of the basement stairs and go down to the coal bin. There he would shovel the coal toward a big heap that the screw conveyor penetrated. Lump by lump, the coal was passed along by the auger until it dropped into the firebox of the furnace. If the auger jammed, fire could travel from the firebox down the auger and into the coal bin. So my father would make sure that the auger was working properly. Then he would open the, do the door of the firebox to make sure that all was well within the furnace. I remember standing beside him one time when I was very small. He pulled on his heavy leather work gloves and lifted the latch of the small, heavy steel door on the side of the furnace. I remember standing beside him. The door swung open and I saw a white hot fire burning hotter than anything I had ever imagined. The fire leapt out into the cool of the basement. I was far from a fearful child, but some nights lying in bed, I would get spooked and start thinking about that fire in the furnace and wonder if flames had somehow escaped into the basement, threatening catastrophe. I grew up and pretty much forgot the inferno that burned below. My parents put in a gas furnace, so small, so clean, so coal deliveries came to an end. Childhood terrors, however, have a very long reach. Just after I turned 50, I broke my neck in a cycling accident. In the rehab hospital, and for months afterwards, as my body tried to recover from the shock to my central nervous system, I suffered terrible neurological pain. I felt buzzing and burning that sometimes ran just under my skin and at other times entirely suffused my legs and arms, my hands and fingers. Billions of synapses sparked and snapped. Perhaps the worst thing about the pain was the inability of the physicians to throw up a chemical barrier that could control it. One night in the hospital, I awoke from a terrible nightmare. I had dreamt that my entire skeleton was burning, every single bone lit by a white hot fire that burned with intense pain. For weeks, I had been struggling to understand the unrepresentable and incomprehensible neurological destruction and it had been and had been at last vouchsafed a vision of all consuming unquenchable fire alive with the fascinations and terrors of childhood it seemed to me an emblem charged with significance that fiery skeleton would not i think be out of place in albrecht durer's allegorical engravings and would find its place among the menacing figures in Night, Death, and the Devil.
You can contemplate that. A few weeks later, another nightmare visited my bed. I was burning again from the soles of my feet, up my legs, my buttocks, around my abdomen, around my back, and down the length of my arms and hands. Yet my skin was intact, and the fire was somehow both outside and inside my body, invisible. I awoke to neurological pain suffusing those tissues and was able at last to grasp the comprehensive scope of my injury. I had understood, sort of, that my legs were completely paralyzed and my shoulders, arms, and hands profoundly compromised. I had not, however, grasped that I was quite incapable of sitting up without support because my abdominal and back muscles were paralyzed too. Taken together, the nightmares comprehend the scope and seriousness of neurological damage to my central nervous system. I was injured skin to bone from the soles of my feet to my sternum. I had to incorporate somehow a new bodily schema and give over the body I had been for 50 years. Slowly, my central nervous system began to recover from the initial shock of injury, and the pain receded. In arduous therapy sessions, I painstakingly learned how to move this new body through space. The months of hospitalization now seem suspended out of time in my memory, and I've been living for many years with the body I became, on October 1st, 2003. I'm thankful that the drugs I take six times a day mostly reduce neuropathic pain to static crackling in the background. Though when I miss a dose, I'm quickly reminded of how bad, bad can be. In the writing I have done about my life, I have tried to keep faith with the nightmare visions of flaming bones and burning skin and not be diverted by the public demand for a story of healing and renewal, suffering and redemption. I want to be clear. I'm leading a life that is not only livable but abundant in many ways. I'm situated far more securely, almost unimaginably so, than people with spinal cord injuries who are dependent on social service, disability income, and Medicare or Medicaid. Believe me, I'm quite alive to the difference. Only a small number of us can find jobs, and dependence on inadequate state services is wearying to the soul, and now absolutely terrifying. Yet the catastrophic injury I suffered did break my life in two and create a body, of two a body of two minds, as it were, one engaged with life and the other drawn toward easeful death. All too often, I'm reminded of what I'm lost and confronted with what I must endure to go on each day. The inevitable infirmities of old age await. At the hospital for special care, the rehab hospital, my rehab was slow because of the difficulty the, the physicians had controlling the pain. There was a psychologist, Dr. Velview. Perhaps his name decreed that he would see depression as an ever-present threat to the health of the patients. To be fair, Depression does all too often trouble people in the aftermath of spinal cord injury. Asadia, the inability to feel, to truly care about anybody or anything, makes life itself burdensome, as it can feel in the wake of paralysis, loss of bowel and bladder function, loss of sexual sensation, susceptibility to skin breakdowns, the deficits of a damaged central nervous system go on and on. 
It's true that I cried many times every day when I was in the hospital. I cried for all that I had lost, a body and a way of life that I loved destroyed. I cried with Janet at my side, straight through the weekly meetings of the team who cared for me, my physiatrist, nurse, and the occupational and physical therapists. At each of those meetings, I declared through my tears that I was not depressed, though I cried every day I was hospitalized and continued for many months after I was living at home. Yet in every day of every month, I loved Janet and rested secure in her love for me. I did not suffer the blankness of depression. Rather, I was dispossessed by grief. I cried because there was no getting better in my future, though I did everything I could to recover strength and function. Both in the hospital and for a year and a half of outpatient therapy, I worked my butt off to regain strength and range in my arms. I worked hard to strengthen my grip. I wept nonetheless for the destruction of the daily life that Janet and I had been making together. To be struck by catastrophic injury the moment I turned 50 just seemed too cruel a fate. I didn't need a support group. I was just infinitely sad. Two years after the accident, I was at last able to return to work half-time at Wesleyan University. I started reading in the field of disability studies. I quickly learned that disability is a deeply contested concept and that there is a scholarly critique of the historical wrongs done in its name. Scholars and activists alike are working hard to rethink what disability itself means and how to represent as positive goods body minds that others may wish to control or cure. I discovered a vibrant scholarly literature and a field that carefully attends to first person accounts of living as disabled. I also found a field reticent on the subject of pain and about grief nearly as silent as the grave. As I began to write, I discovered that these two affects, physical pain and psychic pain, were fundamental to what I had to say. So I turned to the abundant feminist and queer scholarship on embodiment and effective life. David Ang and David Kassangian's important book on grief, Loss, on the Politics of Mourning, is a volume in which queer scholarship, critical race studies, and post-colonial work intersect in both individual essays and in the volume as a whole. In their introduction, Ang and Kazanjian follow other queer scholars in revaluing melancholia. From Eve Sedgwick's work on shame as an unavoidable and formative affect of childhood that sometimes proves decisive for queer subjectivity, to critically queer scholarship responding to the devastations of the AIDS pandemic, Queer studies has attended to feelings of loss and tentative belonging. Ang and Kazanjian join mourning. Excuse me, I'm having a little trouble. Ang and Kazanjian join mourning for, to these losses, to questions of racial melancholia, capitalist remainders, and the end of immediate revolutionary possibility. They write, Loss is inseparable from what remains, for what is lost is known only by what remains of it, by how those remains are produced, read, and sustained. Disability from the first marked by its negative prefix joins these other occasions of loss and possibility. 
Aang and Kazanjian's interest and mine lie in what loss makes of ongoing life. By carefully attending to the impress of loss, a future, however tentative or bold, may emerge. Time will not, however, ineluctably bring progress in its wake, any more than grief will in stages pass away. The process of mourning does not go stage by stage toward healing, despite an essay in psychology today you might consult online. Reading it, you would learn that when mourners reach the state of so-called integrated grief, many people say they have a better outlook on life, live more intentionally, rearrange their priorities. Trust me, this is a very weak read on which to lean. Mourning is not bound in that temporal way, but many of you probably know that already. Ang and Kazanjian discuss instead a process that stays with loss as a way to honor what is gone and give shape to what will come. Mourning is not a progressive affect oriented toward a vanishing point on the shared horizon of a uniform social field. We are not all headed in the same direction, on the same clock. Time does not heal all wounds. In a metapsychological text titled Mourning or Melancholia Introjection Versus Incorporation, the analysts Nicholas Abram and Maria Torek developed the concept of interjection as a process by which the infant re responds to the absence of the mother's breast in the mouth that first irreparable loss. This absent pushes the infant to explore the oral cavity and begin to find its way to language. The wants, I'm not quoting, the wants of the original oral vacancy are remedied by being turned into verbal relationships with the speaking community at large, since language acts and makes up for absence by representing, by giving, figurative shape to presence, it can only be comprehended or shared in a community of empty mouths. Abrams and Torek go on to argue that melancholic affect follows from the failure to interject. Melancholics, they say, are unable to find language to represent their loss because they respond to the absence of the because of, excuse me, because they respond to the absence of the loved one by incorporating it, swallowing what has been lost as if it were some kind of thing. By objectifying and consuming loss, the subject refuses to accept what is no more and refuses, and refuses to mourn, sparing itself pain but thereby blocking communication. The mouth remains empty and the subject downcast. Sigmund Freud theorizes a more straightforward, albeit quite painful, process of mourning that works out the loss of any dearly held ideal, precious object, or precious person. He says the need for this work is clear. Reality testing has shown that the object no longer exists. And normally, respect for reality gains the day. Decathecting or withdrawing from what is lost is nonetheless agonizing. In Freud's account, the terrible work, much of it unconscious, of detaching from what's lost moves forward and time closes up the rent in your world you slowly attach to new objects. I have turned to these theorists in my effort to approach grief as an object of knowledge. I'm trying to find in Abraham's and Torek's community of empty mouths, where all have suffered loss, a way to address the transformation I have undergone. 
I've come to understand that the work of remediating absence by speaking of it is never simply over or decisively finished. Loss can never be stripped of its power to wound because representation is never able to simply make present what once was, nor decisively conclude the effort to do so. Mourning is not a linear sequence of stages, but rather a cyclical, iterative process that repeatedly returns you to the presence of what you have lost, so you must lose it again. Or perhaps the repeated, the repeated returns inscribe a spiral that takes you back while through the same process moving you away. I've come to think that the distinction between mourning and melancholia is a useful heuristic, but no more. I've lost not a person, but a body. With it went my sense of self. Gone is the tactile world in which I felt at home. So I shelter in my mind my lost body and actively recall vividly detailed memories of how my body felt at play and at rest. Against unconscious withdrawals from that body, I strive to incorporate it as best I can. The genius of melancholy shadows my inner life. In thinking about loss, Ang and Kazanjian turn to Walter Benjamin, for he is one of the great and melancholic theorists of loss. From his 1925 study of Baroquely allegorical German mourning plays, through his work on Paris, capital of the 19th century. His notebooks on Parisian shopping arcades and the phantasmagoria of capitalist modernity is now published in English as the Arcades Project, the record of a decade of research in libraries and archives. It's likely that the book manuscript that he was writing that drew on that research is lost forever. His last complete piece is an essay he mailed to Hannah Arendt in 1940 as the Nazis Gain Ground, which has been published in English under the titles Theses on the Philosophy of History or On the Concept of History. In paragraph in paragraph number four of 18, he famously describes an oil transfer print by Clay that biographers tell us was one of his most valued possessions. This is Benjamin. There is a painting by Clay called Angelus Novus. An angel is depicted there who looks as though he were about to distance himself from something he is staring at. His eyes are opened wide, his mouth stands open, and his wings are outstretched. The angel of history must look just so. His face is turned toward the past, where we see the appearance of a chain of events. He sees one single catastrophe, which will unceasingly pile rubble on top of rubble and it hurls and hurls it below his feet. A storm drives him irresistibly into the future, to which his back is turned, while the rubble heap before him grows sky high. That which we call progress is this storm. I confess to having read that many times and had no idea what it meant. <laughs> In Benjamin's hands, Clay's figure is allegorically transformed into the angel of history that looks down appalled at the wreckage, continuing to pile every higher at his feet. The angel would 
the angel would like to pause for years in the archives, as Benjamin himself paused, to awaken the dead and piece together what has been smashed. For not even the dead will be safe from the enemy if he is victorious. And this enemy has not ceased to be victorious. Right-wing, right nationalist victories in Europe, Britain, and the US make vividly clear that this enemy continues to be active and sometimes triumphant. How then are we in our own time and place to attend to the past, care for the dead, abide with our losses? I don't think we should all descend into the archives, but I do find it helpful to think about Benjamin's angel of history, whose astonished gaze is directed resolutely backwards. Aang and Kazanjian know that absence shapes what is present. Grief abides in both public and private life. This is a powerful truth whether you are thinking about the lives of many or the lives of one. In the origin of German tragic drama, published 15 years before the Theses on History, Benjamin studies plays written in the 16th and 17th centuries, during and, during and shortly after the Reformation and Counter-Reformation when religious wars burned on generation after generation. And that is the time of an emblem like that. On stage, bodies pile up in treasonous palace intrigues. Benjamin argues that the proliferation of the tale renders these dramas emblematic, like the allegorical etchings of Albrecht Dürer in which easily recognizable objects bear iconographic significance. He writes, whatever this era picks up, its Midas touch turns into something endowed with significance. Its element was transformation of every sort, and allegory was its scheme. Knowledge, not action, is the most characteristic mode of the existence of evil. Christianity is very clear on this point. Humanity's first sin was to disregard the Lord's commandment, forbidding Adam and Eve to eat of the tree of knowledge. Benjamin develops an erudite reading of these plays as allegories of endless betrayal. Tropologically entangled with evil, as the events enacted on stage signify an irre irrevocably fallen world overseen by death and the contemplation of bones. The tragedies of the Tower Spiel are of the, th are of the thoroughly sublunary world, the evil, mundane, and mortal. Yet Benjamin argues that ultimately, the dramatic intention faithlessly leaps forward to the idea of the resurrection. Death is rebuked by transcendence, as in the last couple of a famous 17th century English sonnet, one short sleep past we wake eternally, and death shall be no more, death thou shalt die. Wounds heal, bones knit together. I wish, nonetheless, to be faithful in my contemplation of brokenness and to learn from the orientation of Benjamin's angel of history. He can neither turn away nor remain in place. I live on, moving inexorably further away from catastrophic injury. But I continue in my thinking to piece together what has been smashed, not to reassemble myself as unbroken, but to trace the fault lines of the break. I'll give you the happier picture, if we can call that happy. 
in the years after my accident, as I began to take up public life once again, I discovered that most accounts of disability would first, would first describe losses and setbacks, then readjustments and rehabilitation, so that in the end the disabled person would inhabit a newly renovated life. I'll give you one example only, inconsequential and hyperbolic, but nonetheless telling. The local Middletown paper ran a story about my accident and recovery, focused on a fundraiser done by my generous massage therapist and some of her friends. They raised more than $1,000 towards the new minivan we needed to buy and get modified so that I can drive independently again. The Middletown Press ran the, art, ran the story as their lead article, first page above the above the fold with a big picture, Carol told me excitedly as she handed me a copy of the paper. I was truly glad that her business, the Therapeutic Massage Center, got good press, but there in large type was the headline, Massaging Away Tragedy. I cock my eyebrow, if I can cock my eyebrow. <laughs> Many scholars have taught us that feelings are rarely a private matter only, but are rather powerful affects working in public. There's little care taken for how, excuse me, there's little care taken for how grief over the destruction of a faithfully honored ideal, a way of life lost to the anonymous pressures of market forces, or the numbing repetition of lethal violence against black and brown bodies, all these losses are painful and leave their impress on bodies and minds. Yet the sufferer is encouraged to move on and may wish to hurry away sad thoughts. Coming undone is thought unseemly, as is publicizing your abjection. In my case, massaging away tragedy transforms spinal cord injury and the disability that followed into a testament of human resilience and a triumph of the will. Such affects contribute to making the way we live feel inevitable and subjectively imperative. The scholarship on public feelings, feelings has been a tremendous resource for me as I've thought about how it feels to live with the compounding deficits of spinal cord injury and my continuing interpolation into the condition of life called disability. As I began reading in disability studies, I learned that a social model of disability has decisively critiqued and, and displaced an older medical model. When the neurosurgeon in the hospital first examined me, said to Janet, she will have deficits, possibly, probably quadriplegia. He spoke in diagnostic language that centered loss and incapacity in my body, suddenly disabled by spinal cord injury, using terminology both ominous and mystifying until you've been thoroughly inducted into life at the hospital. In the social model, on the other hand, disability happens repeatedly over time. I am disabled not by injury and subsequent paralysis, but when I encounter barriers in the built environment that exclude me and dismissive or infantilizing attitudes that assume I'm unable to help myself, I become disabled by an inaccessible built environment or by the person who ignores the diagonally striped lines next to a handicapped parking place that is marked van accessible so that when I return, I find that I can't let down the ramp I need to get back into my car 
And you're never going to do that again, right? No, 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 you're not. It's tempting. Um, more broadly, I'm disabled by a world that doesn't care much whether someone in a wheelchair can participate in public life, whether it's a matter of the stairs at City Hall or the high threshold of a restaurant. Dismissive attitudes have a long and violent history behind them. The historian Susan Jueck has written a book on the, on the municipal le legislation called Ugly Laws, first passed and enforced in 1876 San Francisco. These city statutes moved on sightly mendicants like amputees from the Civil War, blind people, paralyzed people, people disabled by chronic disease, off the sidewalks where they begged for a living and into the cold comfort of charitable institutions. The incarceration was, after all, for their own good. In short order, there were similar laws in Chicago, then in municipalities all over the country. Insti institutionalization of the handicapped reduced them to a diagnosis and put them out of sight and out of mind. No wonder one of the early books in disability studies is titled No Pity. Social disablement creates real problems of nomination. Calling myself disabled is in fact inaccurate given that the deficit is in the built environment, not me. Yet the fundamental distinction between ability and disability is so profound that I have not discovered yet an adequate way to write or speak about myself without reproducing the logic of that hierarchical binary. Other descriptive terms, incapacitated, unfit, injured, impaired, undone, are also marked by prefixes negating a positive state. Those prefixes have occasioned me some real trouble as I have searched for ways to represent the life that I'm now living and the body-mind that I now am. Far from seeing dis disability as a deficit rightly marked by negation, leading scholars and activists convincingly maintain that being differently, being differently capacitated can have real advantages. Autistic activists understand themselves as neuroatypical, which endows some with enviable abilities of memory and quick mastery of highly abstract thinking. Deaf people have developed over a century not only a language and educational institutions, but ways of being together in deafness that capital D deaf understand as a fully, fully elaborated culture, not a disability. Parents of Down syndrome kids argue vigorously that their child's so-called deviation from the developmental norm should rather be understood as benign variation among all the other variations that make for a richly diverse humanity. Crip pride turns the table on the disabling world and orients non-normative body minds to a future of our own making. Disability has become many things since the development of the social model an identity to be claimed, disabled and proud, a civil rights movement. What do we want? ADA. When do we want it? Now. A rhetorical prosthesis that props up narratives, the little lame dolls dressmaker, Jenny Wren, in Dickens's novel, Our Mutual Friend, a canary, in the mind of neoliberal politics, most vulnerable to cuts in
Sorry, I lost my place. Most vulnerable to cuts in public services, a wrench in the works of capitalism, unproductive bodies that don't labor. In other words, it's a, it's a vibrant and various scholarly field. Disability has become a starting point from which to consider whose capacities are rewarded and enhanced, who's neglected and exploited, an approach that articulates with other critical analyses of structural injustice. All life is precarious, but some lives are exponentially more threatened than others. None of these approaches, however, directly addresses the challenge of living with pain. The social model of disablement is just that, a social model. The emphasis on pride that contravenes pity makes discussing chronic pain difficult and forecloses what is, for me, the necessarily interminable work of mourning, the loss of an able body. I'm not surprised that so little writing in disability studies concentrates on pain or mourning. These are affective states that return attention to an individual body-mind, which contests the basic premise of the field. Physical pain is notoriously complex and resistant to medical treatment, and also presents the sufferer with the problem of zero degree significance, since you can only, only describe pain by way of simile or metaphor. My tissues are suffused with a trillion points of light, each one a tiny electric shock. The synapses of neural pathways snap and spark. The pain of grief also remains stubbornly beyond address. That I mourn my lost body and the world of delights Janet and I elaborated together is hardly speakable in the critical discourse of disability. Benjamin's angel faces backward toward the past, even as he is swept away into the future. Only if we reckon with what has been lost can we go forward unself-deceived. Hurried along by the storm called progress, we can blunt its force by asking how history and progress came to be shackled together in the first place. We might take up objects and ideas that are cast-offs of, his, of history's triumphal progress, as Benjamin did. The rag, the rags, the refuse. These I will not inventory, but allow in the only way possible to come into their own by making use of them. Make use of what remains. Consider the oil transfer process that Clay used in making Benjamin's treasured possession. He coated a whole sheet of paper with oil paint or printer's ink and left it to dry. Then he put that sheet, paint or face or ink down, Excuse me. Then he put that sheet, paint, or ink face down on another piece of paper that would take the image and placed a blank paper on top. Using an etching pen, he drew or traced from a drawing already made the image he wished to transfer onto the bottom paper. As the pen compressed the middle piece of paper coated with ink, the line that he drew was transferred to the paper on the bottom. He could then add watercolor water washes or gauche to the line drawing, as in the yellow, orange, and purple of the Angelus Novus. The new image only emerges through multiple layers and a medium already laid down. It requires the prior preparation 
of the paper coated with oil or ink and is called an oil transfer print, though only one copy is made. The impression must pass through the prior preparation. I believe this is the case also for my effort to live on after catastrophic injury and to account for that living on. Representing the feeling of chronic pain or the temporal dislocations of grief opens a way forward, one that must remember what has ir ir irretrievably happened in the hopes of making a transformative future. Loss is inseparable from what remains, and there we may need to begin and begin again. Thank you for your attention.